Hello and welcome to the Q&As on Fetler. What a journey up to the amazing Shetlands, which have an incredible amount of archaeology up there. And it was a, a, a splendid dig with two wonderful objects, the tortoise shell brooch and the soapstone bowl. I think one of the biggest that's ever been found in the British Isles. Um, and we very much enjoyed our stay and thank you for your questions. Um, Frida Blake Br Bradley, discuss the process of lifting solid blocks of material. Um, sometimes, Frida, I think it's a question of, of time and care. If it's a very fragile object, we want to lift the block. And in that way, we can get it away from the site into the laboratory and deal with it in a more delicate way trying to speed up an excavation on a block of material in three days and i think the weather wasn't wonderful on fetler um, putting it in a block and taking it away um, is an important technique and i've often watched jackie mckinley who's an expert on these things wrapping white plaster bandages around objects that we've found uh, in order to keep them completely solid if the soil's packed round them, they're not going to move, hopefully, and you can get them to the lab and use all the tiny instruments that um, are available there to do the excavation. Also, you can do things like carry the whole block and get it x-rayed, so you're not chipping into the thing, not quite knowing where its edges are or if there's a pin exposed or something like that. So there's a lot of good good reasons for that technique and it often meant on time team that we had to wait till the thing had been properly cleaned and processed out of its block to actually see the results. Laurie uh, Benton loved the brooch, uh, very unusual find um, and a question about other Viking boat brooches like this there are th a lot of them. I mean, I think there's probably somewhere near a thousand been found in Britain and 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 um, the coast of Scandinavia as well, obviously. But there, the, if you look them up and under tortoise shell brooch, um, you may so once they were called turtle brooches. Uh, tortoise shell is another name for them. You can see them. Uh, Martin Runquist has got a, a rather nice study of domed oblong brooches that you can actually look up. Um, the brooch ended up in the Fetler Interpretation Center. We've been trying to get in touch with them the last few days to answer some of your more uh, ticklish questions. And um, there they've disappeared, I'm afraid, and are in their homes and the signal's not very good up there. We put in some emails so we hope get we might get some answers from Val Turner who was a very important part of the uh, the excavation. So hopefully we'll, we'll catch up with that. Um, there are some photographs of that brooch. If you put uh, if you put up Time Team's tortoise shell brooch I think there's some photographs you can see of it there. Um, Linda L. Stinson Thank you for your quest question, Linda. Dealing with that whole issue of leaving it in the ground and covering it up and not taking it away. Sometimes, Linda, as you can imagine, it's the safest place for a piece of archaeology. If you take it out, it's got to be looked after, constantly cleaned and renovated, and it's very much exposed to the elements. Something which is buried at a fairly deep level the temperatures are fairly consistent and it's protected by all that earth and in some ways it's better to have it down there and covered than it is in some expensive centre for interpretation which costs a lot of money to build and maintain and the object is exposed to the elements. So it was quite often with a sense of relief we felt we covered the thing back carefully there was a couple of sites where an owner specified that they would like a sort of glass window over a find. And I think we occasionally, uh, that happened, it was their land and, and, and they could do that. But it's not an ideal way because the air, the humidity and various other things causes more trouble than, than, than it's worth really. 
Um, Joe Walsh, um, thank you for your kind comments, Joe. A riveting episode, good pun that. Um, Val just, uh, Val Turner showed how many Viking sites could be on the island. Has further archaeological work been carried out? That's very much a question I'd like to leave to Val, and we'll hopefully get an email from her. But the Fetlar and Shetland Archaeological Society are quite a busy group, and they may well have done further work. There are a number of possible grave sites. Um, there's one called the Fairy Howe, I think, um, and there's a number of them on the island, as well as a number of brocks and other things. And I think it's highly likely they've continued work there, um, which is which is very nice. Um, and you talk about modern technology. I'd be interested to know if, if they've taken advantage of LIDAR work there, because certainly that might help reveal some sites that we didn't know about. Um, Mark Verne and Freestone, thank you for your question, Mark. Um, why does Sonia excavate the tortoise shell brooch? Um, it often happened this, and it wasn't particularly satisfactory for, from Phil's point of view, that we would take Phil away to do something else. Often the reconstruction might involve Phil or some other task. And it wasn't unusual for um, somebody to sort of take over the particular, particular thing he was excavating. And I think that's probably um, what happened there. Um, I, I th don't think there was any more to it than that. Um, and uh, Sonia did a fantastic job, as you can see from, from the end result. Um, Jim Andrews um, commented on soapstone, uh, what a wonderful material it is, and he's found pieces in the States. What's nice about soapstone is it kind of feels soft. You know it's solid, you know it can carry water, you can boil stuff in it, and it's this amazing object but it's got a kind of softness to it that somehow gives it a sort of personal um, interest. Um, it makes it more, I suppose, sensual in a way. You can feel the shape of the stone and they're lovely things to hold. And I agree with you, Jim, it's a smashing material. And we don't often think of carved bowls in stone. We think of wood, we think of pottery, but this is great blocks of stone being carved into a shape. And I think it was a fascinating find that, that Jim, our, our Jim, found Jim Mower, and he thought it was one of the best things he'd ever found. Not spectacular, not a, a silvery object or anything like that, but something really quite exceptional. Um, Beth um, Ortoleno, I hope that's the right pronunciation, Beth, um, and you talked about Viking settlers and the Bardic tradition. Uh, did they have one? Well, I, I think they, they had quite a big bardic tradition. Um, I know, I have a memory that um, there was, there was a, a character called a Skald, S-K-A-L-D, and he was famous for his poetry and his singing and in telling, uh, telling of tales in the Viking period, sort of. And, and one of the things about the Skalds was that they were specialised in a form of sarcasm, which apparently was terribly wounding if you were on the receipt of it. They could be praising the king, but they could be very sarcastic. I'd rather like to see some uh, translations of sarcastic Viking verse. Um, Beowulf, of course, refers to references of songs and poems, and it was a very important part of the court. And I think that Viking... Um, influence is very important. Um, Val, during the program, mentioned the place names. This is another question, Beth, that you had. And yes, there are locations which have very distinctive Viking place names. If you take names like that have B-I, B-Y on the end of them, um, uh, like Whitby in England, but also some of the field names, they often had um, a, a certainly a Viking influence and it often appeared that they were names associated with areas that had the sweetest land. It was like the Vikings went there and they somehow knew when they settled which areas of land would be uh, the best for growing crops. Um, 
Beth uh, Ortolano again, you've got another question. How scripted are Tony's bits in his conversations? By and large, that opening piece that he does is very scripted. The end piece, I used to sit down because we didn't know what was going to happen. I would sit down with the director and we would kind of work that out and Tony would learn it. And it was always a tough time because we'd had three exhausting days and he had to do a single take of a fairly long piece. Um, and that was scripted. The conversational pieces was, was very much just him and the archaeologist talking together. He's very good at that sort of thing. And we would often just give him some headlines. Can you talk about this, this, this and this? And he would hit those things. And, and that was part of the natural feel of the program. Um, so the end piece, as you pointed out, was a bit of a journey into the unknown. And we used to write it just before the programme finished and we all, with great relief, shot back home uh, to get a good bath and recover from the three days. Laura Creasy uh, raises a, a question that comes up quite often. Why only three days? Um, uh, a lot of the origin of the three days was that they had a job during the week. They used to arrive with us on Friday We'd have the discussions, do the initial things then, work on Saturday and Sunday evening or Monday morning, they'd have to go back to their day jobs. And three days became, we discovered we could actually do things in three days. So we could have done longer, but was it better to do evaluations in that time on as many sites as we can do? Or was it, should we have spent longer and done fewer sites? And I think by the end of it, we all felt that we could achieve a great deal, particularly with the geophysics. We could evaluate the geophysics in that three day, um, that three day period. Uh, Amy Carley uh, has got a question, a sort of retail therapy question, possibly. Um, what brand of leather Wellington boots do you occasionally see in those shows? Um, and uh, I've bumped into them occasionally when I got involved with boats, but um, there was a brand which was very popular at the time called Dubarry, which were rather posh, very expensive, waterproof leather boots. And firms like Musto and people like that um, sell them now. They're comfortable, flexible, and by and large, waterproof. But I always think in a, met, m a wet, muddy field, Nothing's better than a good solid rubber gum boot with a good grip on the back. Um, although the, uh, these leather ones look rather splendid from a fashion point of view. So, I, you know, try them on and I recommend them. Um, Sean M. Granger. Um, questions about digs, barrow and furnace area. Um, I think the best place to start there, Sean, uh, is... is uh, the, the, the Barrow and Furnace Abbey itself, which is an extraordinary place. And there's been some huge amounts of archaeology and excavation done there by the Oxford unit, I think, people we know there. And they did a fantastic job of the archaeology there. That is a very, very important area, a very important site. And I think it's well worth, if you go in and look at the Oxford unit, Barrow and Furnace, they also do a sort of general overview of the archaeology of that area, and it's quite fascinating. Um, Shetland Museum and Archive.co.uk is a great site. That, that'll give you lots of information. I think that's in Lerwick. And as I say, <coughs> excuse me, we're trying to get hold of Val Turner to ask some of the more detailed questions. So thank you very much. I'm going to see uh, if the technology holds up. This is from Drawing on Archaeology, uh, Victor's wonderful book. Um, and you can see there a picture of the boat burial, I hope, which was an absolute joy. Um, and, and, and it's one of those, one of the books that I have with me all the time. It's a cracker and I, I can recommend it. So thank you very much for your questions. We've got some very interesting interviews coming up for you with a special guest, uh, which I'll tell you about on Friday. Stay well, and I hope you continue to enjoy Time Team Tea Times. <laughs>